yes. Oh, he's like, get my good side, yeah. In the previous Houseplant 101 Back to Basics episode, we discussed how to assess your space. So once you've determined the type of conditions that you have in the home and also what kind of plant parent that you'll probably be, then you could go to the plant shop and see what they have in order to bring plants home. So I figured we'd stop off at a plant shop here in LA. This is Plant and Nursery. And we're gonna take a look at their plants and see what we should consider when bringing them into our home. Okay, I'm gonna put my bag down and we're gonna take a look at some of the plants here. All right, so some of the things that you wanna consider before actually getting into a plant shop is what kind of conditions that you have and what kind of plant parent that you would be. Because sometimes when we go into a plant shop, we're kind of like willed in by the beauty of the plants, but we have no idea about the conditions in our home and we've already covered that. But one of the important things is once we actually know that we could get a more educated answer from the plant or nursery manager or owner at the shop. Because if we say, oh, we need a plant for my home, how is the nursery person going to really know? Whereas if you come in and you say, hey, I have a southern or western exposure, I get a lot of light, and I travel often, so I don't wanna be around to take care of my plants all that much, they would probably say, bam, you know, come and take a look at some of these succulents. Whereas if you're somebody who's maybe on your like 50th plant, you have a nice eastern exposure, you dote over your plants, you have a humidifier, they might point you to actually something that maybe is a little bit more of a high maintenance plant, like something like we have over here in the prayer plant family, which is Calathea or Japortia, which requires a little bit more high humidity and not a tremendous amount of light. Oftentimes at plant shops, plants are arranged in a certain way. So if you look at this display right here, this is more of a succulent display. So you have some sedums, some athonas, some echeverias, some more sedums. And these in general are plants that require a little bit more heavier light conditions. So a southern or a western window. Now, how would you know that? I mean, generally, if you kind of could look at the leaves, a little bit more of the leaves that are a little bit more of a verdigious kind of hue, this blue-gray hue, a little bit more succulency in the leaves, usually means that these plants are accustomed to a little bit more higher light conditions, or they tolerate a little bit more drought. Whereas sometimes when you go in the interior of the space, you could actually find a little bit more plants that may actually be tolerable to lower light conditions. So if you come in here, and you could see some that are displayed here, like these peperomia and some aglionemas. And these are probably not generally out there because these are a little bit more kind of interior plants that don't need a tremendous amount of light. But I took some of the plants from the inside there and actually put them here because I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of some of the, the breadth and the range of plants. Now, for somebody who has a little bit more, I would say, kind of bright but indirect light or a little bit more diffuse light, there's other great plants for that. And I pulled out this Hoya abovada right here, which has, very similar to these succulents here, a fairly succulent leaf and a very fairly succulent stem. And I kind of did the mistake with my Hoyas of actually giving them the same kind of treatment and light conditions as this. So these plants are growing on other plants kind of in the gaps of forest. So they do like a little bit more diffuse light because they're getting shaded out by some of the trees and the canopy. So this particular plant would probably grow better in an eastern exposure if you're in the northern hemisphere or something that has a bright but indirect light condition. Now, for those plants that can handle a little bit more lower to moderate light, so these are might maybe getting a little bit more indirect light or are in a northern aspect or a northeastern aspect, you might want to look into something like prayer plants, and these are two good examples. You'll notice here that this leaf is actually curling too, and this is a strategy that some of these plants do to protect themselves against water loss. Now, as I had probably shared before, these are a little bit more of a high maintenance finicky plant. So even though they require a little less light, which is so good because 
so many of our apartments don't have a tremendous amount of light, they do require a little bit more higher humidity, which a lot of our homes actually don't have. So that is something to consider. But these are generally lower light plants. So you can manage having them in a, like I said, a Northern or Eastern exposure, but they do require a little bit more attention. Another plant that is good for lower light conditions is Aglionema. And there's so many different types of varieties. This particular one with the pink and red, I would say requires a little bit more light, but there are a lot more stable varieties. And what I mean by stable varieties is that they have natural variegation. This is a more cultivated um, variegation that has been selectively bred by breeders. And from my experience, these require a little bit more light than kind of regular aglionemas, which actually I don't see in this particular plant shop. But um, generally aglionemas, I have a lot of those growing kind of away from even window light and getting a little bit more kind of like ambient light or grow lights. And these are one of the few plants that I'm actually growing in the interiors of my space. And they seem to be growing just fine. One of the things to kind of keep in mind is that a lot of these plants have probably just come from the greenhouse. They might have only been sitting here for a couple days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks at most. So they don't spend a tremendous amount of time at your retail center, generally speaking. And they've been given probably the ultimate optimum conditions in the greenhouse. So they're probably a little bit more of a compact plant and uh, they don't have long internodes, which are the spaces between the nodes. So you could see here, this is an internode, and they have short spaces between the nodes. Whereas if you got something that had not a lot of light, oftentimes that starts to stretch and become a little what we call leggy. So you wanna actually find a plant that is nice and compact, nice and bushy, depending on the particular plant that you're getting. Even this, this one, for example, this is an H. cananthus, which is a type of lipstick plant. Now, I'm growing one of these in my home, and I've been growing it for probably four or five years now, and it is much longer. It's not that bushy, it's actually quite bare on top. And part of that reason is that your plant will actually change form once you bring it home, because you're not giving it the same amount of light or conditions that the plant was given in the greenhouse. So this plant, even though you say, wow, this looks so full and so beautiful, four or five years down the road, it might actually have some bald spots. It might be a little bit longer. So unless you're kind of pruning it, you're giving it a really great skylight, you're giving it all the optimum humidity that it potentially needs, it's probably not going to look like this. So I just wanna say this because I want to set up your expectations when you're actually living with plants because if you're treating like the plant just like a decor item and you want it to look perfect, then you're probably going to have to come and get a new plant all the time versus just having it grow in your house and developing kind of a, a character in giving it the kind of like suboptimal conditions within your home. Some of the other things to kind of consider when you're looking at the plant is not only just the compact growth structure, but something that you could do is actually pull the plant out of its nursery pot and make sure the roots look healthy. So we have this aglionema here, and you could see they have all these nice green and white chubby little roots coming out. And these all look very healthy. If you're starting to see roots that look brown and mushy or dried, then you could probably tell that that is a plant that is not as healthy, and I would actually you know, put that plant back. We could take a look at this Dracaena, formerly known as Sansevieria. And you could see very similarly, has nice kind of thick chubby roots. It's not too root bound or anything along those lines. And we could take a look at this prayer plant. You can see that has a nice healthy root system right there. Not too root bound either. We'll take a look at this Hoya. And this one seems a little bit drier, which is totally normal with Hoya because they're a little bit more epiphytic species, meaning they're growing on trees and other plants and they don't like to be totally wet all the time. It's actually not beneficial for their roots, but that, that looks like a healthy root system. And I also pulled out this one over here. And you can see that this one, a little bit drier and pretty root bound down here. So this is a plant 
that if you were to buy this plant, you would kind of tease out some of these roots. And I would particularly plant this in a pot that is slightly larger than this. So you just have to be a little bit mindful. These are pretty healthy roots already, but um, this is something that you would definitely want to repot. And typically I would recommend that you would wait for about two weeks to get this to acclimatize to your own home before you actually repot it. But honestly, I don't often wait that long in order to be able to repot a particular plant. But it's a good form to actually, you know, be able to pull the plant out of its pot, check its roots a little bit, and also check the tops of the leaves. Because if you see anything, any kind of bugs, you could be looking out for spider mites, you'd look out for mealybugs, you'd look out for potentially scale. Oftentimes a lot of those bugs are difficult to see. And generally speaking, when I come to a garden center, they usually have really clean plants. One thing to kind of be concerned about is if you have some of your interior plants actually growing outdoors, they probably have a higher propensity to get a little bit more um, pestiferous insects on the plants. So you would just be a little bit more mindful around that. And I've actually gone into nurseries and I have like a little magnifying lens that sometimes I'll, I'll check on plants, but usually you don't even need to go that far. You just really need to eyeball it, see if it's a healthy plant, take out its roots, get a sense of whether that is actually a healthy plant as well. And, uh, and consider that that could be something that you might actually want to buy. So how would you know whether a plant actually needs to be repotted in a larger pot? And I'll give you a great example. If you come over here and you look at the succulent, you'll start to see some of these little roots that are kind of sticking out from the bottom of this nursery pot. So this is a particular plant that I would say you would want to pot it in a planter that's probably the next size up. When I say the next size up, usually it's like, two inches larger because it gives a little bit more space for the roots to be able to grow. Even that little inch of space below is going to be a little bit better for this particular plant. Or you could even go a little bit more like a one size up from, from this planter pot. But that is a telltale sign that the plant is going to want to grow a little bit larger. You know, this plant I would say is not so root bound, but the roots are going to want to grow a little bit deeper than what they have. Going back to this polka dot plant, you'll see that this one was really root bound as well, but the roots are healthy. So you wanna make sure that you give this a little bit more soil to grow into. So you'd have to get a planter pot that's the next size up from this and a little bit deeper. So you'd put a little bit more soil there and tease the roots out with your fingers very gently and allow that to actually then grow into the soil system. So speaking of soil, if you don't have soil in your home, then you're going to want to bring a bag of soil home with you so that you could repot your plant. And again, as I had mentioned, I generally like to give my plants a little bit of time to acclimate in the house. So you could actually leave them in their little nursery pot, as you could see here. You could even put it in a cash po, which a cash po is a decorative plant container, um, or you could actually repot them but giving them a little bit of time to acclimatize to your home is probably going to be better for your plant. But once you actually are repotting your plant, you're going to want to get some soil. And you can see that they have some potting soil, some perlite, um, and they also have some cactus citrus planting potting mix. Generally, the cactus mixes have a little bit more aeration in them by using some inorganic materials like perlite, which is a little bit more like puffed volcanic stone. You could see some of it actually falling out here. It kind of looks a little bit like styrofoam balls, but this is puffed volcanic stone that they use for aeration within your soil potting mix. And the reason why you want to have aeration in your soil is because it creates a little bit more healthier roots because surprisingly, roots actually breathe much in the same way that plant leaves breathe as well. So having a little bit more aeration, particularly if you're a little heavy handed on the watering, is going to be good for your particular plants. On the backs of all potting mediums, you'll be able to find the list of ingredients on the back. And that's not something that we're going to go 
deeply into, but if you actually want to know what's in your potting mix, then you could actually look on the back much in the same way that you would a nutrition label if you're looking at food. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is take a look at plant pots. There are certain different types of plant pots. Terracotta is probably one of the most popular. It is a super reliable planter pot. You wanna get one that has a hole in the bottom, especially if you're new to growing plants. And the reason for that is you want the water to be able to drain from the bottom. And of course, if you have that, you need something to put in here, like a basin, so that it catches some of the water. Terracotta is porous, and that is good for a reason that I'm about to explain to you, but it doesn't mean that it's a good thing when you're putting it on top of a wood surface because it will actually leach a little bit of water and probably leave a stain on that wood forever. So you want to be a little bit more mindful when it comes to that. Now I have seen, and it's not in this store, but I have seen actually glazed terracotta basins. It actually makes a little bit more sense if you're going to be growing that on a wood surface because it's there to protect the surface so it doesn't get wet underneath. One of the things that you could do when you get a terracotta pot, because it's porous and it actually pulls the water away from the particular plant, especially if you've watered it too much, is that you could actually soak this in the water for about two minutes. And that actually fills all the pores up within the terracotta before you actually plant your plant in it. Now, when you're planting your plant in a terracotta pot, you're going to want to have about one to two inches of soil medium on the bottom. And you want your plant to come up right around this rim or a little bit higher up. And the reason for that is you don't want it to come up right up to the top because when you water it, that water might actually spill over and damage the surface that you actually have the plant on top of. I personally like terracotta just because for that reason that it is porous, that it helps suck away some of the moisture for a particular plant, especially if you have a plant like a Hoya, for instance, that doesn't like to have its roots sitting in water. Now, if you have something like a little bit more like a maidenhair fern, and you might not know this already, but a maidenhair fern likes to be in a little bit more of a moisture system. So you either have to water it a lot more, or you could actually use something that's a little bit more like a glazed ceramic or a plastic pot, because that maintains the water inside the planter at a higher rate than if you had something porous like terracotta. This is actually a great example of something that is a little bit more glazed. So it still has the hole in the bottom, but it has a glaze on the surface. So it's not going to be as porous as terracotta, even though it has this kind of like terracotta finish on the inside, it's glazed on the outside. So you're not going to see some of that water being taken out from this particular planter pot, but it'll actually retain a little bit more of the water inside of it. Now, something like this, it has no hole in the bottom versus something like this, which is heavier and is a terracotta pot and has a hole in the bottom. So these are things to kind of consider. This planter pot without the hole is something that I would consider more of a cash po. And a cash po, which is spelled, spelled a little bit more like cash pot, this is more a decorative planter pot. So if you have a cash po like this, sometimes you'll wanna put like a little basin inside of it. So sometimes they'll give you like plastic basins similar to this. You'd obviously have to find something that kind of fits the size, but you never want your plant sitting in water in a basin. It will actually soak that water back up and maybe some of the salts will actually go back into the plant roots. So it's, it's pretty good in order to be able to have a basin that you could remove and actually spill that out in your sink or wherever you're actually going to pour that water. And, um, and then that way, it's something that won't um, be soaked back up into your plant roots or your plants are gonna be sitting in that kind of wet diaper, if you will. So you would actually put, this is probably not the right size, but for demonstration purposes, this is what I'm gonna do. You would actually put your planter pot in here and keep it within the actual nursery pot. So you'd wanna have something that's a little bit larger that might stick like out like this. In this case, this euphorbia is actually too small, but for demonstration purposes, you kind of see the point that you keep it within the nursery pot, you water it, the water goes down into the cash po, 
and doesn't drain out of the bottom. Now what's the benefit of having something like this versus something like this? Well, I have to tell you that this is a terracotta pot and it's already pretty heavy. Whereas this is made out of probably fiberglass or something like that and is super lightweight. So if you have to hoof this up like several flights of stairs in your apartment, then you may want to consider something like this just for the ease of being able to actually carry it. Because something like this, it's just going to be a little heavy. But let's actually talk to the shop manager here because I want to find out from her what people ask when they're plant newbies and coming in to actually buy a plant. Oh, shop dog. oh <laughs> he yes. Oh, he's like, get my good side. Yeah. Oh, 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 what a good pup. So you've been here for eight months and this mm. store has been here for two years. When somebody new comes in to buy mm. a plant, what are some of the questions that they ask you? What am I not going to kill? What can handle no light, no water? Um, what's going to clean the air and not kill my pet? Okay. And it's a lot of questions. Yeah, that's a, that is a lot of questions. Yeah. So what are some tips? Like if I come in and I say, you know, what plant am I not going to kill? So first we want to find out the conditions of the space that the plant is going in. And then from there, I just ask them to look around and see what they like just visually because a lot of times you can make something work in a space. Um, and a lot of the like hard to care for plants are actually pretty easy if you just know like, hey, don't go overboard with the watering. Oh, this pot needs a drainage hole. Oh, don't put it in direct sun. Like really simple things that a lot of people just don't realize right away. And so we walk people through how to care for each plant. And then we say, if you have any questions, just call us mm -hmm. if it starts to die just pick up the phone and we'll like walk you through what you need to do differently. Because a lot of times people already have an experience where they killed a plant once and then they kind of lose hope that they can do it again. So most of the time it's like reviving people's hope that they can take care of a plant without killing it. A lot of times people make the same mistakes over and over again, which is overwatering or just not waiting as long in between waterings. And so a lot of the plants just boil down to let it dry out between waterings or keep the soil slightly moist but not soggy. And most plants are like on that spectrum somewhere. So if somebody comes into the store, ideally, like what would, what questions would they actually have already answered before they walked into the store in mm -hmm. order to be able to find the best plant for them? So. I would want people to bring photos of their space and bring inspiration photos if there's like a look that they're going for that they like, that they've seen somewhere else, or a plant that you saw in a restaurant or someone's front yard when you were driving. Just like bring as much information as you can in and then talk to the employees because this is what we love to do. We love to like talk to people all day. Like we have some regulars that come in and just hang out and it's almost like cheers or something where they're like not here to buy anything necessarily but just to like discuss plants and then they go away having learned something and it's just um, really nice when people are just like willing to have a conversation and a dialogue and I feel like if you just like take care of and nurture your interest in plants then the ideas will come for free. In the last two episodes we've learned how to assess our space and what information we should know before going into a plant shop. If there's other questions that you have, write them in the comments below. And in the next special episode, we'll see how we can apply what we've learned in real life. If you like these Back to Basics videos, then give them a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to the channel as it helps me produce more videos. And if you want to be notified as soon as a video is uploaded, then click on the notifications bell. To get a complete course on houseplant cultivation, care, maintenance, and more, then head over to houseplantmasterclass.com. And be sure to check out my upcoming book, How to Make a Plant Love You. Pre-ordering before July 9th, 2019 will get you access to my 50 care houseplant spreadsheet and pre-release of a botany at bedtime video at the Huntington Botanical Gardens. Details are in the description below.